Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over pediatric care in the healthcare setting. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please uh, support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Something else I want to bring to your attention, I have also started um, NCLEX reviews specifically going over the next generation type NCLEX questions, the formatting, and also going over test taking um, tips and skills. Now, you guys know my time is extremely limited, so I don't have many dates available. So um, be sure to check that out on my website. You can see, you'll see the link for um, scheduling. It is through Squarespace and you just look for Nexus Nursing. You'll see my calendar, what's available. And I made sure that I made it affordable so that uh, any student, whether you're a current student or you graduated, should be able to um, be able to take this course. But like I said, seating is limited. Don't say I didn't warn you. You guys know how crazy busy I am, but I did it. All right. So be, be sure to check that out. That's also on my website as well. Um, before we get started, I want to start off with a prayer as I always do. If you're not into that, please don't leave me a mean or hurtful comment in the comment section. All you got to do is fast forward. Literally just press that born button and skip forward. Okay. If you are into it, go ahead, close your eyes, bow your head. Let's get started. Father God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for another day on this earth. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given us once again to be going over this nursing information. Father God, I pray for every single student that's watching this video, Lord. I ask that you please help them to understand the information that's going to be covered. And when they see these same principles and um, and concepts again that they can understand this information father god and be able to process and think through it and get the correct answer lord father god i pray for every single viewer i ask that you please help them have the discipline to put that time aside to study i ask that you please help them get rid of those distractions in their lives that are causing them to not to be able to study father god or anyone with her bad intentions that doesn't want them to study or is distracting them or whatever it is that's going on in their life that's pulling them away from their studies lord i'm asking you please Please, 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 Lord, allow them to have that opportunity at that time where they have a quiet place to go to and actually sit down, buckle down and go over this information, Father God. Help them to cover the information that they don't understand and so they can understand, it, Father God. Lord, I ask that you please bring people into their lives that will be a source of encouragement for them, Father God. Bring people into their lives that want to see them succeed and to do better and help them get to that next level, Lord. I ask that you please help them to not be discouraged. I don't care if this is the 10th time that they're trying to pass their boards. Please help them to stay on track and to continue to study and to do better, Lord. I ask uh, that you please bless them and to bless their support systems, the people who are there rooting for them, Father God, that are encouraging them, whether it's emotionally, financially, that they're physically um, backing them, that they're babysitting for them, whatever it is, the people who are just helping them, Lord, I ask that you please bless them as well, Lord, and help them to continue to be a source of encouragement and positivity in this viewer's life. Lord, I ask Ask that you please help me as I'm going through this information. Help me to explain it in a way that the viewer that's watching this, that's listening, that they can understand it, Father God. Lord, let it not be me, but let it be you speaking through me. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A family's decided to withhold extraordinary care for a newborn with severe abnormalities. How should the nurse interpret this decision? One, newborn has no rights. Two, it's the same as euthanasia. Three, it's, it is illegal professional practice. Or four, the newborn is being allowed to die. What do you guys say? And guys, the correct answer is four. The newborn is being allowed to die. So in this case, guys, where they remove extraordinary measures, the, the patient, the newborn is still getting the basic care. They're still getting basic care. They're still getting comfort, but there's no action being taken that will actually cause that patient to die. They're just being a, allowed to die. Uh, they're allowing nature to take its natural course, but care is still being provided. Okay. So let's look at the wrong choices. One, the newborn has no rights. 
they do have rights and their rights are, you know, being respected. When I say they have rights, their basic needs are being met. The new are being met. That newborn is still being fed, right? They're still being changed. They're still being comforted. So their basic needs are being met. Met. Two, it's the same as euthanasia. No, euthanasia is um, intervention or a deliberate act to cause death. That's not what's happening here. Um, choice three, it is. Uh, excuse me, it is a legal professional practice, and that's not true, this is a very legal professional practice, so correct answer is number four, the newborn is being allowed to die, but again, their basic needs are still being met. The nurse is planning an initial home care visit to a mother who gave birth to a high-risk infant. For what time of day should the nurse schedule the visit for it to be most productive? One, when the husband's out of the home. Two, at a time the mother's feeding the infant. Three, at a time that's convenient for the family. Or four, when the nurse can spend time with the family. And the correct answer is three, at a time that is convenient for who? The entire family. Think about it. When it's on first, an initial visit, what do you do initially? You are always assessing. Assessment is anything that garners information. So you're looking, you're asking questions, you're getting feedback, you're observing. You need every member of the family there because you want to see the family dynamics. You want to see how they interact with each other. You want to see how they interact with the baby. You want to see what they're doing good. You want to see what they're doing wrong so you can provide feedback and teaching, right? So that's the correct answer. You don't want to come at a time where everybody's busy, everybody's scrambling, nobody has time to answer questions that you may have. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. Um, one, when the husband's out of the home. Well, that's not very helpful because the husband is part of the family. You want to see how that husband's interacting uh, with the family unit and also with the newborn, with that patient. Choice number two, at a time when the mother's feeding the infant. If the mother is busy feeding the infant, how are you going to assess the infant? How are you going to assess how that mom is coping with the infant and also the rest of the family dynamics? She's busy, right? Choice four, when the... Look at choice four. When the nurse can spend time with the family. In nursing, it's never about you. It's always about your patient. So it's never going to be on your schedule. It's what's best for the family, what's best for the patient. So the correct answer, guys, is choice number three. When picked up by a parent or nurse, an eight-month-old infant screams and seems to be in pain. After observing this behavior, what should the nurse discuss with the parent? One, accidents and the importance of their prevention. Two, limiting uh, playtime with other children in the family. Three, any other behaviors that the parent may have noticed. Or four, food and specific vitamins that should be given to infants. And the correct answer is three. Assessment. The first part of ADPI is assessment. Get information. Why? How come every time I pick up this kid, they start screaming? What's going on? What has changed? Have you noticed any other um, behaviors that the patient was not exhibiting before. We're trying to get information to come up with what? Our nursing diagnosis. And after we have that nursing diagnosis, we're going to have what? A nursing plan. And after we have that nursing plan, we're going to carry out what? Our nursing intervention. After we carried out our nursing intervention, we're going to do what? Evaluate what we just did. Add pie. But the first part is assessment. Get information. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, accidents and the importance of their prevention. How do you know that patient was in an accident when you didn't ask any questions? right? Choice uh, number two, limiting playtime with other children. Why would we limit playtime with the other children? Did the patient get hurt playing with another child? Well, we wouldn't have known that unless we did what? Ask questions. Next, choice number four, food and specific vitamins that should be given to infants. What does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with why the child is crying? We need more information, so we're going to assess. A one-week infant has been in the pediatric unit for 18 hours following placement of a spica cast. The nurse observes the respiratory rate fewer than 24 breaths per minute. No other changes are noted. Because the infant is apparently well, the nurse does not report or document the slow respiratory rate. Several hours later, the infant experiences severe respiratory distress and emergency care is needed. What should be considered if legal action is taken? 
One, most infants' respirations are slow when they're uncomfortable. Two, the respirations of young infants are irregular, so a drop rate so a drop in rate is unimportant. Three, vital signs are outside the expected parameters are significant and should be documented. Or four, the respiratory tract of young infants are underdeveloped and their respiratory rate is not significant. What do you guys think the correct answer choice is? And the correct answer is three. The vital signs are outside normal expected parameters. Um, this should be documented. Something should be done about it. Look at those, um, the breast per minute, 24. We are talking about a one week infant. We expect the respiration to be between 30 and 60, right? So there's a problem with those respirations being so low. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, most infants respir respirations are slow when they're uncomfortable. Uh-uh. When an infant is uncomfortable or they're in pain, just like adults, our respiratory pattern increases, so does theirs. Why? Their metabolic rate increases, so they need more oxygen, right? So we don't expect the respirations to go down. We expect it to go up, so that's false. Uh, two, the respirations of young infants are irregular, so a drop is unimportant. First of all, Look at what it says, irregular. Just the word irregular means not normal. So guess what? The respirations of a newborns, it's not normal for it to be abnormal. It's not normal for them to be irregular. That is completely false, right? Now let's look at the second part of um, the wrong answer choice. So a drop rate is unimportant. Let me tell you something. When you are testing and they give you a clinical situation, 99.9999999% of the time, whatever is happening is important. That's why they're telling you that it's happening. So if you are in doubt and you have no idea what the answer choice is, don't choose the one that says this is not important. This doesn't matter. If you have no idea what the answer choice is, choose something where you're actually doing something to help your patient, okay? So this is wrong, wrong, wrong. Choice number four, the respiratory uh, tract of young infants is undeveloped and their respiratory rate is not significant. Excuse me, this infant's out the wound, they're whole, one week old. Why um, are there, is their respiratory tract undeveloped? That's false. And the second part, again, saying that the respiratory rate is not significant. At 24 breaths per minute, when the normal is 30 to 60, this absolutely is significant. So the correct answer choice, guys, is number three. The vital signs are outside the expected normal rate, so you better do something about it. What suggestions should a nurse give to help a parent with a two-month-old infant who has colic? Select all that apply. All right, guys, how do we treat select all the ply? We tr treat select all the ply as true or false. Let's go. One, get smaller, more frequent meals. True. Why? Smaller, more frequent meals are going to decrease cramping. And matter of fact, guys, this goes across the board. Let's say we weren't even talking about infants. We were talking about adults. Same thing. When it comes to the GI and where patients having GI issues, they're having nausea and vomiting, always small, frequent meals, right? So correct. True. Very good. It's going to help decrease, decrease, again, the cramping and just decrease GI irritation. Choice two, burp frequently when giving a feeding. True. Why are you burping uh, frequently? You want to decrease the amount of air that's in the GI tract. It'll decrease the amount of what? Gas, which will decrease the amount of discomfort that the patient will experience. So true. Three, place a warm heating pad on the abdomen. True. It didn't say hot. Never hot. We don't want to burn the patient. This is a newborn. Their skin's very delicate. We're not trying to burn them. It doesn't say hot. It says warm. Why warmth? Well, we know warmth causes what? Muscle relaxation. So it'll help, with, um, help the muscles re um, relax and increase comfort for the patient. So true. Four, offer warm sweet tea when crying begins. There are a couple things wrong with this answer choice. Number one, why are we giving tea to a two-month-old? When that patient is an infant, which means that first year of life, what are they getting? They're getting breast milk, they're getting formula milk, or maybe a combination of both, but they're not getting tea. That's number one. And number two, you see how it says sweeten? All of that sugar, all of that glucose is irritating to the GI tract. 
and will cause discomfort, not increased comfort, okay? So that's absolutely false. And then choice five, rocking the baby gently in the quiet room when crying begins, that will um, help to prevent um, GI irritation, but it won't help treat. If you go back to the question, it says to help an uh, infant who has colic. So if they already started crying, they're already having that um, discomfort. It's not preventing the discomfort. So the correct answer choices here, guys, is choices one, two, and three. What nursing intervention best meets a major developmental need of a newborn in the immediate post-operative period? One, giving a pacifier to the infant. Two, putting a mobile over the infant's crib. Three, providing the infant with a soft, cuddly toy. Or four, warming the infant's formula before feeding. And the correct answer, guys, is one, giving a pacifier to the infant. Why? The infancy um, stage. So remember, everything's about what? The mouth. So number one, giving a pacifier to the infant, that meets, meets what? Their oral needs. That's sucking, right? Look at choice two, putting a mobile over the infant's crib. This is a newborn. So number one, um, they're not going to be able to focus on that mobile, right? And number two, they just had surgery, so it's not like they're going to be flat on their back anyway. And even if they were flat on their back, they're still not going to be able to focus on the mobile. They are a newborn, so that's false. Three, providing the infant with a soft, cuddly toy. This is a newborn. newborn. They're too young to enjoy that soft, cuddly toy, right? Absolutely not. You don't want to have it near the infant where it could just be on their face and they suffocate. Four, warming the infant's formula before feeding, number one, that's um, not really necessary. If it's breast milk, it was just expressed. That's number one. But number two, more importantly, the question's asking about major developmental need. How is warming that uh, milk going to meet a major developmental need? It doesn't. But giving a pacifier and not logging do that, that sucking motion meets their what? Developmental needs for the oral phase that they are in. So the correct answer, guys, is choice number one. What characteristics does a nurse expect infants and young children who have a failure to thrive exhibit? Select all that apply. How do you treat select all that apply? As true or false? Let's go. One, hyperactivity. False. Patients with failure to thrive, we actually expect to see the opposite. We expect them to see, we expect that to see them like lethargic, quiet, not really moving, not really interacting with their environment, not hyperactive. So that's false. How about two, language deficit? True. With failure to thrive, we tend to see deficits in language, act, language or motor activity or even social um uh, uh, social activity, right? We expect to see a deficit, so absolutely that's true. How about three, being overweight? False. Patients with failure to thrive, um, exactly what it says, failure to thrive, failure to grow, physically, emotionally, intellectually, right? Fa failure to thrive. We expect them, we expect to see them below the fifth percentile, right? So we don't expect to see them overweight where they're higher than the 85th percentile or be higher than that 95th. No, we expect them to see them underweight below the fifth percentile. So that's false. We, and they tend to be, you know, very small. Four, proneness to illness. True, true. They're prone to be ill. They're more likely to be ill, absolutely. And not only physically, they're more they're more likely to be also um, emotionally ill as well. Absolutely, they tend to be very frail. Choice five: responsiveness to stimuli. Oh, I gave you guys an answer in that in another explanation, but that's false. We tend to see decreased or maybe even non-existence. Res non-existent response to their stimuli. They're really not interacting with their environment the way we expect them to, okay? So the correct answer choices here is choice number two and choice number four.
A parent and a three-month-old infant are visiting the Well Baby Clinic for a routine examination. What should the nurse include in the accidental prevention teaching plan? One, remove small objects from the floor. Two, cover electric outlets with safety plugs. Three, remove toxic substances from low areas. Or four, test the temperature of water before bathing. And the correct answer is the four, test the temperature of water before bathing. Why? Their skin's very delicate and it's easy to cause burns and we don't want to burn the patient. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, remove small objects from the floor. They're three months old. They're not even crawling. They're not even rolling over yet, right? So yes, it's important to, you know, remove small objects from the floor, you know, for your safety because you're the one moving around but they're not even rolling over yet, much less crawling. So that's not our priority at the choices that have been given to us. Two, cover electric outlets with safety plugs. Again, they're not even rolling over, much less crawling to a safety plug. Choice three, removing toxic substances from low areas. Again, they're not even rolling over, much less crawling to get to an uh, area where there's a toxic substance. Remember the age of the child, they're only three months old. But at three months old, you're the ones that's going to be giving them the bath, right? So you better test that water temperature to make sure it's not hot so you don't cause a burn to the patient. A nurse is teaching a parent how to prevent accidents while caring for a six-month-old infant. What ability should be emphasized about the infant's motor development? One, sits up. Two, rolls over. Three, crawls short distances. Or four, stands while holding onto furniture. And the correct answer is two, B, they roll over. By six months, they should be able to roll over, right? Not three months, but definitely by six months, we expect to see that. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, sitting up, we expect to see that around seven, eight months. Three, crawling short distances, we expect to see that around nine months. And then what was number four? Oh, standing while holding onto furniture, we expect to see that around to eight, the eight to 10 months a milestone, we expect to see that, right? But rolling over, we should see that by six months. A seven month old girl is to be catheterized to obtain a sterile urine specimen. One of the infant's uh, parents expresses fear that this procedure may traumatize the baby psychologically. How should the nurse provide reassurance? One, the fear is justified and the nurse should obtain a clean cat specimen. Two, parents have a right to refuse the catheterization and the concerns are realistic. Three, although the concern is appropriate, the need for a sterile specimen is priority. Or four, the procedure is uncomfortable, but there should not be a damaging long-term effect. And the correct answer is four. They're only seven months old. Um, at that age, there is no concern with sexual integrity where um, they'll feel like um, uh, their sexual privacy is being violated. They're not going to have any psychological, psychological um, issues with that. Now, as a student, if I were you and I were looking at this list of questions and I had no idea what the answer choice was, I would say to myself, okay, this is a multiple choice question. And I noticed out of four, three of them have something in common saying that um, this concern is realistic. And only one of them is saying this is not a realistic concern. So if I don't know what the answer is and I had to guess, I'm going to choose the oddball out of the multiple choice. And it would have been number four, okay? At seven months, they're not concerned about their sexuality. Choice one, the fear is justified. No, it's not. Choice two, parents have a right to refuse the catheterization. That's true. But guys, be careful. Remember I told you these test writers, they will give you a part of the answer choice that's correct to kind of wheel you in and then the rest is false. If the whole thing is not correct, the whole thing is wrong. So look at the first part. Parents have a right to refuse catheterization. That's true. But look at the second part. And the concerns are realistic. No, they're not. And then choice number three, although the concern's appropriate, the concern's not appropriate. So the correct choice is number four. A nurse is assessing the oral cavity of a six-month-old infant. The parents ask with which teeth will erupt first. How should the nurse respond? One, incisors. Two, canines. Three, upper molars. Or four, lower molars. What do you guys think? 
And guys, the correct answer is one incisors. And we expect to see these two, the bottom incisors, we expect to see them erupt around six to eight months, right? Yeah, so the correct answer is one. Choice um, two, the canines, like the pointy teeth, those canines, we expect to see them erupt like um, around a year and a half, 18 months. And then choices three and four, the upper and lower molars, we don't expect to see those because we expect to see those last and we don't expect to see those erupt until about 20 months. So the correct answer choice, the ones we expect to see to erupt first are going to be the incisors choice number one. A nurse is teaching a class of new parents about how to position their infants during the first few weeks of life. Which position is safe th safest? Guys, if you've been watching my videos for any amount of time, you know the answer. I talked to you about this a million times. One, on the back lying flat. Two, on either side lying flat. Three, head slightly elevated on the left side. Or four, head slightly elevated on the right side. What's the correct answer choice? One, back to sleep. If they're sleeping, they need to be on their back. All of the other choices, they may fall forward. And remember, what's the age? Um, first few weeks of life, they don't have that strength in their neck to lift their head so they can suffocate. If they're sleeping, they have to be on the back. During the day, while they're awake, they can get tummy time and be on their tummy. Parents of a sick infant talk with a nurse about their baby. One parent says, I'm so upset. I didn't realize our baby was ill. What major indication of illness in an infant should the nurse explain to the parent? One, grunting respirations. Two, excessive perspiration. Three, longer periods of sleep. Or four, four crying immediately after feedings. Two, grunting respirations. That's not normal. So if that patient's trying to breathe, that grunting sound you hear is them trying to breathe. And what happens is they're trying to keep oxygen in the alveoli. Remember, the alveoli, that's where gas exchange takes place, oxygen, carbon dioxide. They're trying to keep that oxygen in the alveoli. They're trying to breathe. That's the grunting sound. It's, it's a natural mechanism. Like they do it. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Compensatory. It's a compens compensatory mechanism. It's natural. And they just do it when they're ill or they're trying to breathe, like they have trouble breathing, that grunting sound is not natural. So you teach them, you see your grunting, you see um, nasal respiration, nasal um, respiration, the, the nasal flaring, excuse me. You see um, them using their accessory muscles trying to breathe, you need to call the healthcare provider, right? So um, choice number one, the grunting respirations. Choices number two, excessive perspirations. Well, we're talking about an infant. Their exocrine glands is not even developed yet, so we don't expect to even be seeing them sweating, right? Choice number three, long periods of sleep, and choice number four, crying immediately after feeling, uh, feedings, that's not necessarily a symptom of illness. It could be something else. So the correct answer is one. Where you see grunting respirations, you know something's wrong. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. An infant's admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit, that's the PICU after open heart surgery for the repair of a ventricular septal defect. By the way, I have a great video on uh, VSD. Make sure you go back and watch it. It's in my peds and in my um, uh, cardiology um, nursing playlist. Go watch it if you need to learn about it. But anyway, the patient has VSD. Uh, place the nurse assessments in order. What are you going to do first to last? Here are your choices. Assess the heart rate, the operative site, the urinary output, the respiratory status, and IV catheter. Okay, number one always, airway. Airway, remember airway breathing circulation. If that patient is not breathing, nothing else matters. So the first thing we're going to do is assess the respiratory status, number four. Make sure our patient's breathing. Okay, number four, assessing the uh, respiratory status, we're assessing airway, we're assessing breathing. What comes next? Circulation. So we're going to check what? Number one, the heart rate. And along with the heart rate, we'll also do our other vital signs, right? We're going to look at the vital signs, we want to look at the blood pressure, all that good stuff. After we checked respirations, after we checked heart rate, what's next on our list? We're going to check that um, IV catheter. Why? Remember, physiologic. whenever you guys get a question about priority, you have to think about physiological integrity. What keeps your patient alive the longest? Remember, airway, breathing, circulation, hemodynamic status, fluid and electrolytes, nutrition, glucose, anything that physically keeps your patient alive. So after you make sure your patient was breathing, 
After you make sure there was circulation, right? What are you going to check for? You want to make sure that they're going to be able to get their fluid, their electrolytes, their glucose, their medications, everything else. So we're going to be looking at that IV catheter site, right? What's after that? So after IV catheter site, then we're going to look at the operative site. And remember, if you go back to the question, it says that they just had surgery. So it's too soon. They just had surgery. It's too soon for us to see signs and symptoms of infection, right? But we know after a patient has surgery, there's three concerns we're going to have. Infection's one of them, but they just came down from surgery. So um, even if they do develop an infection, we're not going to see those signs and symptoms right now. But I'm just, I just want you to know, that's why I'm bringing it up right now, that we're looking that you're always going to be concerned about infection after surgery. But after surgery, immediately, what else would we be looking for? Bleeding. So we're going to look at the surgical side to see, okay, does this dressing need to be changed, right? What does it look like? And uh, the third thing, by the way, after surgery, regardless of the type of surgery a patient has, besides infection, besides bleeding, you're always going to be concerned about the patient developing a DVT. You're going to be concerned about um, a thrombus, that thrombus moving, going to the lungs, causing a pulmonary embolism. So those three. But anyway, so you're going to look at the operative site. You want to look at the area surrounding the surgical site. You want to make sure the patient's not bleeding. Does that surgical site need to be changed? Are there orders for it, right? So you're going to check the operative site. What after you check the operative site? Last, urinary output. What does urinary output tell us? Urinary output tells us about um, possible, possibly that patient's fluid status, but even more importantly, it's going to tell us about the kidney function. Because Kidney function, and let me tell you something, whenever something is severely wrong with the patient, one of the first things that start happening is the kidney start to shut down. Mm -hmm. You'll see the urine output go down, You'll see that BUN and creatinine start to go up. So you know something's severely wrong with your patient. Maybe your patient's bleeding out. Who knows? But the urine, uh, the, the urine output, the kidney function will tell you a lot about what's going on with the patient. So you absolutely do want to look at the urine output, make sure that the kidneys function the way it should. So again, number one, respiratory status. Then number two, heart rate. Then number three, you're going to look at the IV catheter site. Then number four, operative site. And last, the urinary um, output you can address. And guys, that is it for this video. There's more to come because on this video, I was hoping I'd be able to get more questions in because I only touched the infants. I didn't even get into like, you know, children, older children, or even adolescents. So there's definitely going to be more to come. Please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover next. Don't forget to check out my website. Not only do I have audio lessons available, I now have limited, but it's still there, um, booking dates for the uh, Next Generation NCLEX that is coming up 1st of April. So be sure to check that out. And um, if you're watching, I have uh, lots of viewers that are not even in the nursing field, but they're just interested in the kind of things that I talk about and they're just interested in nursing. And if you're one of those viewers, but you know someone that's in nursing, um, tell them about... Um, the review, like I said, the price is very reasonable. Maybe you can even purchase it for them as a gift. Anyway, also, almost daily, you guys can catch me on my other social media platforms covering a variety of nursing topics on my TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So be sure to check me out there. Thank you so much for watching my video, and you guys will catch me on the next video.